وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode from the Muslim family by al Madrasatul Umariya and inshallah we're going to be continuing what we had discussed in the previous episode relating to advice and nasiha for problems that happen with your children children that are going through a hard time and children that are maybe causing a hard time for their parents and what would be our advice so we're going to continue on with that advice inshallah ta'ala from the advice that i think is extremely important is that as a parent you need to be uh, fully plugged into what your child is going through you need to be fully aware of it and we mentioned that as a parent you should always be ahead of the curve you should always be aware of things before they happen and i just wanted to emphasize that in this advice that often when your children get into trouble or into difficulties these difficulties had signs and if as a parent you're awake and aware of what's happening then you see these signs in your children and you can deal with them again uh, before uh, they become worse and in this we have to understand that there are really two things that uh, lead people astray and i think we've mentioned this also in the course before and they are shahawat and shubuhat they are desires and misconceptions so as for the desires we train that with tazkiyat and nafs with a tawbah and teaching people to purify themselves and and you know we're all in need of that parents and children and as for the shubahat we respond to those with knowledge and i mentioned this as it relates to children's education but i think it's pretty important as it in, in terms of when things go wrong try to identify why are things going wrong is my child confused do they have misconceptions or do they have desires and things they want to do where they know it's wrong but they are they they're craving to do it anyway and no doubt the teenage years are the years of a shahwat the years where the shahwa is strongest the desire to do wrong things is strongest and that's why there are ahadith rebuking the older person who follows their shahwat who is has has submitted to their desires because ultimately the desires should be uh, they they should they should reduce as someone gets older so sometimes we say shahawat and shubahat but really it can be both both of them can come together you can have a situation where a person is has a desire to do something and is also confused they're not sure if it's wrong or why is it wrong or what's the ruling on it and maybe they've heard their friends tell them it's okay or my parents said it wasn't a problem or i've heard someone on the internet say this so it's important that you deal with both of those two issues you look at whether there are desires coming in there whether there are shubhat confusion and again this is with older children typically this is children usually talking about the around the age of puberty or above here where you have the shahawat and the shubhat coming into play because younger than that again you may see an inkling of this or you may see the beginnings of this like you may see certain confusions or misconception they have but it should be pretty or relatively easier to deal with it at a younger age when it gets older it can be problematic and that's why you have to try to catch these things uh, early on and there's no doubt that our society that we're in in our situation is very different to um, for our children today as to what what it was when we were younger and what it was when our parents were younger and what it was when our grandparents were younger Uh, society has changed massively so you as a parent need to understand that in terms of the fundamentals in terms of the theory in terms of the ayat the ahadith how to make tarbiya of your children how to educate them and prepare them for their life this is ultimately something that there doesn't change you know islam doesn't change allah azza wa jalla made this religion suitable for all of the people اليوم اكملت لكم دينكم واتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الاسلام دينا today i have completed your religion for you and completed my favor upon you and chosen for you islam is your 
religion. So Islam is suitable for all people at all times. But what does change are the mechanics of how the shahawat and shubuhat get to our children, how this confusion happens and where it comes from, the internet and, you know, that those kind of issues. So that that's uh, very important for a parent to be aware of those things and understand how they work and understand what it is that our children have access to and where they might be going astray. And I think that you can't claim to be mas'ul, responsible for your children, if you're not aware of what kind of things can be affecting them. And from this, we have the hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu an. كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْأَلُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَنِ الْخَيْرِ وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الشَّرْ مَخَافَةَ أَنْ يُدْرِكَنِي He said, the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم about good, and I used to ask him about evil so that it didn't happen to me. So it's important to be aware of the, or out of a fear that it would happen to me. It's important to be aware of the things that might affect our children and where they come from before we give that license for our children to get involved in those things. So for example, your child has a device and you should be aware of what they could download on there, what most of the kids are using today. There's probably very little point mentioning in my video any names because if I mention them in my video, by the time someone watches the video, they might be out of date. But you should definitely be aware of the latest apps the kids are using, uh, platforms, and what those things allow them to do. And what, why, whether as a parent you want to allow your children complete freedom on it, or complete ban, or supervised usage. Because those are three options you have. You can either allow them unrestricted access to a particular thing like an app for the Qur'an. Or you can completely ban them from something like an immoral you know, uh, uh, website or something like that. Or you can go where you have a restricted access. And that's what I would recommend for things like YouTube. In all honesty, I would not recommend even though this course is going out on YouTube. And YouTube has become a major means for da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, the, some of the content on there could destroy your children. So it has to be supervised, controlled access, not uncontrolled, in my opinion. And Allah Azawajal knows best. I think that's, very, that's a very important part. So now we come to talk about, uh, we, we come to talk about the, uh, the outside influences the influences that might come from outside. Before we do that, it's also really important that we talked about shahawat and shubuhat on the topic of uh, shubuhat, of uh, confusion and misconceptions. It's really important that you get your children answers to their questions. You give them answers to their questions. It's very, very important um, that you give them answers to their questions. Otherwise, if they don't get answers uh, to their questions, Subhanallah, the, the, the effects on them can be can be very strong, subhanAllah. Uh, and it can lead them to real, really going astray later on in life. So if you can't answer it, you need to find someone who uh, who is able to answer it. So as we come to talk about the influences from the outside, the external influences. So here I want to talk about two types of external influences. One is the external influences that are not friends but things that come into the home. TV, uh, gadgets, uh, tablets, phones, um, computer, etc. This is one kind of external influence. And it's really important that you, when you have problems with your kids at any age, even at a very young age, you look to see what those influences might be. And as we said, one category are phone, iPads, tablets, computers, TV. All of these are, are major, major influences upon the child. So do they have access to them? Is it unrestricted, totally banned, or partially controlled? And if it's partially controlled, is that partial control actually working or not? That is one aspect. And then, of course, we can't uh, disregard the role of the friends. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, A person is upon the religion of their close friend. So let every one of you look at who you've taken as a close friend. Now a person may look at that and say, well, 
Can I even influence that for my children? How do you even influence for your children, even at a very young age, who their friends are going to be? Making friends is kind of a personal thing. You can't kind of say, look, Abdullah, you should be friends with Muhammad. But what you can do is you can improve the probability of them making good friends by the help of Allah. And you do that in two ways. By removing opportunities to make bad friends and making bad friends difficult for your kids. Make having bad friends hard for them and reduce the opportunities to make bad friends. So stop them going to environments where they can make bad friends. And when they have bad friends, make it hard for them. And probably how to do that might be beyond the scope of this lecture, but don't make it easy for them. On the reverse side, give them as many opportunities to make good friends as possible. So that could be through the masjid, it could be through knowing families. I know this family and I know this son, mashallah, is a good, is good boy practicing and, and so on. So I'm going to introduce the two and then make it easy for them, like facilitate it for them, but facilitate for them the things they want to do with good friends and encourage them as much as possible to have good friends, even at a very young age who you allow your children to mix with from a very young age and the kind of environment they get used to from a very young age will influence the kind of friends that they want to have when they're older. And friends, if friends are the problem, be willing to make uh, changes, be willing to even enforce changes if you have to. If you determine that the problem here is friends and really you've maximized everything you can do on the side of tarbiyah, then here I think that you look at the friends and you have to say, if this is the issue, then we need to be willing to really make significant changes. But again, link that to what I said earlier about the gadgets and so on, that you might restrict access to a certain group of friends in person, and they might just replace that by contacting them electronically. So here you have to be aware of what's going on and you have to, we're not gonna say that you can completely control the friends your children make, but you can certainly make it easy for them to make good friends and reward them for doing so and you can also make it difficult for them or less likely for them to make bad friends and discourage them from doing so. And that comes back to that concept of rewarding your children for Islam. Don't reward them for passing an exam. Well, you can if you want, but don't reward them more for their Islamic achievements and make it achievable. Don't ask your children something. You have to imagine for a teenager, you go to them and say, you got to give up all your friends today. And it feels like it's not achievable. They feel ages, I can't do it, it's impossible. But if you look at it and say, well, really, what do we want to do? Let's do one, two, let's try and reduce this. Let's try and improve this. Let's say that really the big problem is one particular person. Let's move away from, and give them alternatives. Give them other options uh, to, to make things achievable for them so they don't feel that what you're asking them is impossible. And even with very young children, this is something which is, I see a lot is as parents, we often ask our young children things that are impossible or near impossible. And so they feel that they can't win. And because they feel they can't win, they actually give up trying and say, I'm not gonna bother, I'm not gonna listen because there's no way that I can get this reward. There's no way that I can stop this punishment from happening, so I may as well do what I want. So you have to make it, you have to make it achievable and you have to make it, you have to make it winnable look at their salah because one of the major things is your prayer should stop you from doing wrong things inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar the prayer stops you from immorality and wrongdoing the prayer stops you from immorality and it stops you from doing wrong things so if their prayer is not stopping them from doing wrong things then something's wrong with the prayer and that shows you wallahi the benefit and the intelligence and the wisdom in teaching your children to pray from an early age because the salah is what's going to stop them doing wrong inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar be honest with yourself as a parent are you an example for your kids or are you a negative example are you telling them for example to be uh, are you telling them to be truthful but you lie or encourage them to lie yourself or they see you lying themselves so that's also something to bear in mind. Bear in mind that the, the more effort you put in and the more, uh, the more responsibility you take, the more likely it is with the help of Allah Azza wa Jal you bring 
goodness out of it. And likewise, if you sit your child in front of the TV all day watching garbage, then the principle is garbage in, garbage out. And if you if you sit your children in front of the TV all day watching rubbish, then to be honest, it's that's what's going to come out from them. Don't expect anything different. So really don't push your kids over to the TV. I would not honestly advise any household to have a TV. I don't see the need for it. Whatever Islamic benefits you thought you could get from it, you can get from the internet. So I, I, I personally just, I don't see that the TV, I see it brings a lot of harm and I don't see it brings any any good. And Allah is the most best. From the advice uh, that I would give is, uh, I would give the advice that there is a time for everything. So a lot of times parents complain about uh, their children asking for things and saying that they want their children to, um, their children ask to play games and so on and so forth. So presuming these games are not haram, and that's a big presumption, but let's presume that they're asking to do something that's not haram, then there has to be a time for this and a time for that. Everything has to have its time. وَلَكِنْ يَا حَمْضَلَ سَاعَةً وَسَاعَةً But oh حَمْضَلَ, there is a time for this, there is a time for that. So there has to be an appropriate time for everything. And if we don't have that system of there being a time for everything, they won't be able to find that balance within their life. And there'll either be constant complaints that I want to go out and play and I want to play football, I want to do this or that or the other. And on the other side, this, you know, the, the important work, the Islamic work doesn't get done, the study doesn't get done, serving the parents doesn't get done. So there has to be a time for everything. So I think the default answer when your kids are always asking you for more time to do things, it should be sa'atan wa sa'a. There is a time for this. There is a time for that. Uh, having, we talked about uh, looking at the friends from a negative uh, aspect, we should also say that friends can be a massively positive uh, role models and looking at, you know, especially slightly older kids that they can look up to and they can aspire to be like them. So that's also something to bear in mind. Peer pressure is not just negative. Peer pressure can also be positive as well. Positive peer pressure, the friends who say to you, come on, let's go and pray. That's positive peer pressure. So you can use that to your to your advantage as well. And I think also that in general, uh, Islam sets a methodology out and that methodology is at-targhib wa tarheeb That methodology is encouraging and discouraging. Encouraging good and discouraging bad. That's what the methodology of Islam is. At-targhib wa tarheeb Encouraging you with the rewards of Jannah, discouraging you with the threat of the fire. And that same methodology is a natural methodology that works with Bani Adam, all, all human beings. The carrot and the stick. You know, you encourage and you also discourage. And that's what you have to do with your children. Encourage good behavior. Don't have it all punishments. Punishment, punishment, punishment. And don't have it all rewards. But they have to be rewards and they have to also be punishments. It's also really important to make sure that your children have or have enough uh, of enough activities to take their attention. You know, subhanAllah, idleness and just having nothing to do is among the worst of things that opens the door to the shaitan. Uh, that just having nothing to do and just being idle and not having, you know, not having any way to, to get out their energy. So look for permissible ways to channel their energy. And all the work we've done with young people. I found this to be, to be honest, one of the most powerful things uh, that a person can do is to channel the energy of your children. Give them physical activities to do, things that challenge them mentally, uh, you know, fill their time with beneficial things, even beneficial things in the worldly life, but, but make it beneficial things, fill their time with it. Because idleness and just having nothing to do is one of the things that opens the door to the shaitan in many different ways. And often when we take some of the children who their parents have said are, you know, really in a bad way, really gone off the rails, and all we do is give them two things. We put them in an environment where they have good people around them, and we give something to drain their energy and take their and their attention. And subhanAllah, within a short time, just a few days, you see huge improvements. Now we're not going to say that you know not every time is there a camp available you can send your kids on to or something like that or a program that you can do but look at ways you can channel energy and attention in a positive way 
if there's a lot of sitting around playing on the computer, that's not it's not helping. You know, so look at ways you can challenge that energy or channel it into a positive, a positive way. These are some of the pieces of advice that Allah Azawajal made easy for me to mention. And Allah Azawajal knows best. And this brings us to the end of the topic on the segment on Muslim children. And what we're going to do after this, inshallah, is we're going to talk about Muslim parents. And this is going to be a, a segment where we're going to talk about parents and treatment of the parents. And then inshallah ta'ala, we're also going to talk about some pet problems people have with their parents, some difficulties that can happen in terms of birr al-walidain, being good to your parents. And then we're going to go on to talk about relatives and the wider relatives and salat al-rahim, how do you keep ties with your relatives inshallah ta'ala. So this is as we come towards the end of the course now, we don't have that many episodes left inshallah, but we're moving into that segment on parents and that segment on uh, on relatives inshallah ta'ala. And that's what Allah made easy for me to mention. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Wa salatu wa salam ala Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.